The Bible says in Revelation 21, this is a very, very, very bittersweet message for me, and it didn't start out that way until 9, 10 a.m. this morning when I got some news from the person, but I'll tell it at the end. Tonight's message is called Alone in the Midst of a Crowd. Winston Churchill said that a tree by itself, a solitary tree, if it grows at all, it grows strong. It is true that we face many trials. Some of you tonight, the trials you're in are of no consequence, not of our own making. Some are a direct result of our decisions and actions. We, like that tree, are alone at times. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> Sometimes very alone. But what about the tree that grew up in the forest? Not a solitary tree, but surrounded by those like him, family of sorts, Yet this tree feels alone in the midst of a crowd. He can't see the forest for the trees. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Never growing up strong because he or she feels choked out by others near them. Like at a football game with 90,000 spectators, shoulder to shoulder, sitting down next to each other, strangers. And though you are surrounded by thousands of people, you feel alone in the midst of a crowd. Zephaniah 3, 16 and 17 says that in that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Let your hands be weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. The Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Let's pray. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus, the matchless name of the master carpenter, the one who paints a portrait when there is no paint. Father, I ask you to take every person in this room or anyone watching by YouTube or this channel, God, that they have an understanding of your spirit. They have eyes to see and ears to hear what you would say to them tonight. In Jesus' name, anoint your word. Amen. Put your power on the ears and hearts of the people listening. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Go with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Everyone went to his own house. The last verse in the chapter before. Everyone went to their own house. Look at verse 1 in chapter 8. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst of them, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Don't fantasize too much on me here. In the very act. Now Moses, verse 5, in the law, commanded us, they said, that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing Jesus, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and he wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear them. Caught in the very act. Guilty as charged. Come on, stay awake with me, church, unless you're praying for me. Stay awake. Come on, help me out here. Why the woman? Where's the other party to the adultery? She must have felt alone in the midst of this crowd of rock throwers. Amen. Amen. She must have pondered in fear her demise at the hands of those who were there. Who some of them she perhaps even slept with. Say amen. 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 She faced death. But Jesus made a valid point when the Pharisees pressed him saying, But what do you say? Verse 5. 
And verse 6 says, this they said, testing Jesus like you and I go to test Jesus. Well, you've tested him before by blaspheming his name, say amen, 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 amen. Like they might have something which to accuse him. You've got to follow the law. Then if that's the case, try the man and the woman at the same time. It's called equal opportunity adultery under the law. Say amen. amen. And he wrote on the ground with his finger. And so he did not hear. Verse 7, as they continued asking Jesus and speaking to him in that manner, he who is without sin, Jesus said, among you let him throw the stone at her first. And once they felt conviction, they left one by one Amen. until it was just Jesus Amen. and her. Thank you. She was not alone anymore. Never was alone, truly, with Jesus there. But then Jesus said to her, where are your accusers? Thank you, Father. They're all gods. But then he said something powerful. Go and sin no more. Now, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, even as some of us as believers, we make mistakes, we do things, but I haven't done any armed robberies in 47 years. I think I'm okay, Pastor. I'm not going to rob the church tonight. I promise. They left one by one. See, that's the key is repentance. Turning away from. Don't go back, Jack, and do it again. Say amen. 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 Ask Jesus to strengthen you and give you the power to quit the sin that so easily besets you or threatens you. Look at Luke 15. Go there with me. I don't know if you can get it on camera. If you want to get it on camera, you can edit it out later. But with me, I want you to come here for a moment. I can't wait to the end of this service to tell you what I know. <laughs> you are in a new season. And to everything there is a season in heaven and on earth. But you're in a new season. And this season that's coming, that's actually already here because of Christ in you, there will be power now behind your words and the laying on of hands. Amen. I've seen too much. I've been around this world. I've been with other ministries doing tents all over North Carolina and California and different places. I've seen it in the prisons. I've seen too many miracles. I've watched with my own eyes a woman in North Carolina as she sat there with her Hispanic sister. And this evangelist went up and looked at the first one and said, you're her sister, correct? And she goes, yes. And the sister sitting next to her was a Hispanic woman. Her eyes were almost shut from, from infection and stuff running down the side of her face. And this man of God looked at her and said, you tried to commit suicide three times. And on the third attempt, you wrote a note to your family, but you couldn't find the right words. And God wants you to know tonight that you're no longer going to do that. And this woman collapsed on her knees. And when she got up off of her knees, her eyes were completely clear. There was no more infection. Don't tell me there was an acid trip gone bad. I've seen too much. And I've seen a lot in you. I've seen a lot in this young man. But your season is now rapidly changing. Don't fear the wind. Don't fear the storm. And don't fear the snowfall. Don't fear anything. Because when you lay hands again on the sick or the homeless or whatever it is God's got you doing, they will recover immediately. Not because of you, but the power of God that's in you. And you've not let God down. You've never let Him down. Oh, you've sinned and fallen short like we all have, but you've not let Him down. You have a biological father, but God's your dad from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Look at Luke 15 with me. Give the Lord praise for a moment. Please. Luke 15, verse 3. So he spoke this parable to them saying this in Luke 15, 3. So he spoke this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, and he says to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. 
I say to you that likewise, verse 7, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Jesus cares about the one. The lonely one in the midst of the crowd. The one here tonight that has all of the phylacteries been broadened. Oh, they've got all the right words. They've got the cross around the neck. They've got the Bible. They've got the scripture. They've got the memorization. But they don't have a relationship. Amen. Don't shout me down, church. I'm telling you the truth. Amen. God is looking for the real deal. Amen. He's looking for repentance in this church and in this nation. You might as well start here. Jesus cares about the one. In fact, you are not alone in the midst of your crowd, the ones you may find yourself in. You could be married to the right woman or the right man, loving God. You could have the right children. You could have the right job. You could have the right church. You could have the right attitude, but you could still be alone in the midst of your love for other people. But the Bible says in Deuteronomy 31, 6, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God goes with you, and he'll never leave you or forsake you. Come on. Yeah. Yes. Amen. One person is valuable to Jesus Christ. Amen. He knows the crown of influence in your life, the good, the bad, the <coughs> forgiven ones. He knows all by name. But look at Isaiah 43 with me. Are you following me so far? Yeah. Isaiah 43, look at this. Verse 1, Isaiah 43. But now, thus saith the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Just ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they'll tell you there was a fourth man in the fire. Amen. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the thoughts I have toward you to do good and not evil and give you a future and a hope. And you'll pray to me, you'll call out to me, and when you do it with all of your heart, I will hear you say to the Lord, and I'll bring you out of your captivity. I know what captivity is. I know what pain is. All of you in here have a story about it. Your own pain, your own story, your own death row experience. Mine began when my mother died of cancer when I was 15. Subsequently, three years later, my father was murdered, and I had to deal with that. And I dealt with it in the wrong way. I became that lost sheep that went out into the ditch of life and was dying. Until Jesus decided to leave the 99 and go after the one. The one addict, the one psycho, the one that was in prison for attempted murder, six felonies. He was in the midst of my storm and I didn't even know it. Every choice we make, church, and those listening, every choice you make, if it's a good choice, there's a domino effect. It affects other people too as well as you. If it's a bad choice, it goes the other way. And a lot of people around you, especially those that have been addicted and suicidal and in prison, out of prison, in rehab, out of rehab, going through the cycle of madness that happens with people, and we find ourselves alone in the midst of a crowd. We find ourselves having a form of godliness but denying the power. There has to be the power of God to change a man or woman's mind about addiction. There has to be the power of God to set someone free from suicidal attempts and binding that devil and casting him out. There has to be the power of God on his word to change a life in here tonight. Say amen. Amen. I hated God, especially after my father was murdered. I shook my fist at God and I cursed his name, but yet he still loved me. Though you may feel alone tonight, in your misery, he is there. Alone in your pain, he is there. Alone in your heartache, he is there. And he will remain tugging at your heart until you surrender. 
every man and woman, every child, anyone who's listening by the sound of YouTube or any other way, we are all one heartbeat away from eternity. How do I know? Because I got a call this morning. Young or old, black, white, yellow, brown, educated, uneducated, rich, poor, makes no difference. Addicted, not addicted. There's no sin too big, God can't forgive. But there's no sin too small, it doesn't need to be forgiven. Say amen. amen. And I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. One heartbeat away from eternity. Alone in the midst of a crowd. I don't want to go into too much detail, and the names have been changed to protect the innocent. The story you're about to hear is true. He knows already. This morning at 9, 10 a.m., I get a phone call, you know, on my phone that says, unknown. Normally I don't answer unknown because I'm not buying beach front, front property in Arizona to say I don't need another deal for maintenance on a vehicle I don't own. I don't need an extended warranty on the home I don't have. So I don't, never answer, but today I did. And it was from a county here in Oregon. Is this my name? And I said, who's asking? He tells me who he is. And he starts asking me questions. And finally he came to the point. He said, I'm from the coroner's office here in this county in Oregon. Do you know this individual? And I said, maybe. We're trying to find the family because we found him dead. In the early 1980s, while I was away from God, even after being saved in prison in 1977, how many of you know you ought not marry the wrong person? Do I need to do a sermon on that one? I mean, come on, man. Now, your past is your past, and it's under the blood of Jesus. And if I was from New York, I'd say, forget about it. <laughs> room, please. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for love in all the wrong places. In fact, this man on the phone asked me, did you marry so-and-so? And I said, that's none of your business. To make a long story short, It was my stepson that I raised for 11 years. He was dead today, this morning, at 8 a.m. Sorry. And in your mind, the first thing you think of is, what kind of job did I do as Daddy Joe? Mm -hmm. As Stepfather Joe? <coughs> was it something I did wrong? Or all of that guilt, shame, and condemnation that would come to a man? As I was all jacked up about this message tonight, it kind of took the wind out of my sails. Does somebody know what I'm talking about? And then I realized something, that there was a time in his young life, though he was involved in all the wrong things like I was in some ways, he surrendered his life to Christ in a Gresham shelter being attacked by an Asian gang. Mm. And in that attack, <clears throat> he stabbed one of them and then he ended up going to the penitentiary. But he received Christ. 
And how many of you know there's no erasers in heaven? If your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, God's not waiting for you to blow it so he can erase your name. Say amen. 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 Now, you want to live a, a miserable Christian life and moonwalk away from Jesus and go do your own thing? And even though you've surrendered and you've, you've confessed Christ and said, Lord, forgive me. I believe you died for me and I'm born again now. But here's the deal. You can live your life like the woman was caught in the very act of adultery. You can be accused. You can be put before a court. You can go through all of that. But who wants to be saved and make heaven your home and have wasted some years and time when you could have been a fruit bearer? Say amen. 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 And all I can remember of that young man some 30 years ago was a little four-year-old. They grew up. I don't know the reason why. He wanted to tell me over the phone the details. I said, sir, I, I don't want to know. I got enough problems. Amen. Amen. But it's not going to steal my joy, church, because I'm going to tell you something. All things working together for good to those that love God and are the call according to His purpose. Amen. Not your purpose, His purpose. Well, I don't understand why there are storms of life. Well, Jesus promised storms. He says, in this world you will have problems. Go with me to John chapter 16. Are you still with me, church? Yes. Yes. John 16, look at this. I marvel at his word. John 16, look at verse 31. Jesus answered and he said unto them, Do you now believe? Indeed the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered each to his own, alone in the midst of a crowd, each to his own. And you will leave me alone, Jesus says, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, verse 33, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. This word, overcoming and understanding this, means something. These things I've spoken unto you. This word, overcoming and be of good cheer and all of that comes from a Greek word. In the New Testament, tharseo, meaning to have courage, be bold, take comfort, be unafraid, even in the midst of your storm and in the midst of your crowd and your loneliness and your despair and your pain and your heartache and your frustration. Listen to me. Some of you in here know, some of you watching know that when you've cried and you can't cry no more, you're grieving, you're hurting. I was that way when mama died. I was that day when daddy died. I was the same way. Then when I went to the penitentiary, I had to turn the valve off because you can't show emotion in prison. Or you'll wear mascara. Say amen. amen. I understand being in jail and prison. The real deal. The cotton fields. The horrible insanity of murder and rape and suicide. But the reality is you don't have to go to razor wire and guard towers and concrete when you're walking on death row in your spirit right now waiting for lethal injection from the devil trying to take you out in your despair. Trying to take you out in your loneliness. Trying to take you out in your failed marriage, whatever the case yeah. might be. He's after to steal, kill, and destroy, but I got news for you. Greater is he that is in me and many of you than he that is in this world. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. And boy, do I need strength. Amen. Wait till you're 68, homeboy. Yeah. You, you'll understand what it's like to go out and work on a ranch like I've been doing and pressure washing and staining decks and digging ditches with my hands. Not my mind. Say amen. 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 Jesus knew what it was to be alone. Thank you. Amen. Can you imagine the massive spiritual and physical and mental and emotion that he was feeling on the cross when he knew and he could see in the spirit how his own father turned his back on him because he could not look at sin. And he took all of it on his shoulders for every drug addict, every alcoholic, every loser, every failure. 
every human being on this planet. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Do you really have the courage to trust God to deal with your individual and personal problems? Knowing by faith that He will do what is right even when we do what's wrong. On your behalf, He'll do that because of His great love for you and His mercy. He's trying to give you now, not Sunday, not manana, tonight. He wants to give you mercy so you no longer feel alone in the midst of a crowd. He's here. I've seen too much, Barry. I've been walking this walk for 47 years. I've been doing prison ministry. I'm going to a Teen Challenge Center Wednesday in Estacada. I'm going to all these prisons on the way to, to Idaho. We're in Parma, Idaho, the 31st Sunday. I'll do a church there with four other churches in, invited. And there'll be a lot of purple hair, white hair people that will say, hey, here's what you don't know. The Lord sometimes shows me things in advance of where I'm going. Like He showed me about you. There are women in this church in Parma, Idaho that are in their 70s. There's one for sure that I already know when I see her I'm going to know because I've already seen her face. That was molested as a child by her pastor. And God is going to set her free indeed. On the 31st, somebody say amen. 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 And here you are. Oh, some of us are in various stages of repair. We're in God's body shop. Amen. Some of us just have a few pings and a cracked windshield. But some of us need an overhaul because our engine's shot. The transmission won't go. We won't even talk about the rear end. Say amen. amen. <laughs> Help me to edit. Why? Tonight. Why? This condition. Why do you keep going around and around and around the mountain? Why do we say and do all the things that we know is right, but yet nothing changes? Do you really have the courage to trust God? I watch men in prison. I've seen men and women in churches that refuse prayer. I ain't going for it. A preacher can't get me to come. I ain't trying to get you to do nothing. I want the Holy Ghost to deal with you. And I want to be a vessel of honor, not dishonor. And I want to lay hands on you and anoint you with oil and pray God set you free and you'd be happy once in your life. Because if you looked at your face right now, you'd be wondering why is it not smiling? Something's going on with you, lady. Something's going on with you, sir. And he don't want no fake facade. He don't want no fake joy. He wants the joy of the Lord to be your strength. You've got to know when you're doing right and you're living right and living clean in an unclean world, though we still sin and fall short. I haven't sinned today yet. Maybe even during this message. <laughs> You've got to know your Heavenly Father is looking down at you right now. Amen. Boom, he's going. Ha! He's cracking up over this kid. Why? Because he knows he's his offspring. And he's already laughed at him. Uh, right? He's happy with Boone. He's happy with Whitney. He's happy with you when you're doing right. And the Lord's joy, him cracking up. Think about it. The joy of the Lord, somehow, when that's happening and you're well pleasing to the Lord, it transfers into strength for you, lady. Amen. Amen. The joy of the Lord is your strength, yeah, yeah, yeah. it becomes power. It becomes the ability to laugh in the midst of a coroner report this morning. Dealing with the memories I've had and have had and still have. Oh my God, this life is but a vapor of smoke. <clears throat> it's here today and gone tomorrow. Alone in the midst of a crowd. 
What is your crowd, sir? What is your crowd, man? Is church just a sanctuary for you? Is church just a place to go to, to feel God so when you leave you don't feel Him no more? That's not how it works. When you're born again and you're washed in the blood and preferably filled with the Holy Ghost, had that experience, that Book of Acts experience, nothing can take your joy. Nothing can make you unhappy anymore. Though I hit myself with a hammer this week, I didn't shout hallelujah and I didn't pretend <laughs> Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh with the hammereth. Amen. <laughs> Amen. As long as you're living in this body of flesh, there's a war going on, Galatians said, between the spirit and the flesh. Amen. And if you don't know Christ, listen to me, those that are what if you don't know Christ, you cannot overcome what you're going through. Oh, you can go to rehab. You can talk about recovery. Brother, you got to get that message back that I gave you. And I want you to teach these men the difference between freedom and recovery. Yes, I, I, when I hear the word recovery, I want to slap myself. <laughs> I don't want to be in recovery. I don't want to be white knuckling. I don't want to go through 12 steps. I want Jesus to set me free. I had a $200 a day meth habit in 1974. Sticking a needle in my arm. Don't tell me you've got a problem with your headache, Jack. I'm telling you, you ain't got no alcohol problem. What you have is a flesh problem. Because you war. You don't know how to fight the battle. You've got the wrong bullets and the wrong gun, Jack. You don't know how to deal with it on your face. You don't know how to get on your face and cry out to God and say, set me free. Because you really don't want it. Well, I've been in uh, blah, blah, blah recovery, and I've been over here to this recovery. Well, how many times you got to hear the truth? <laughs> now listen to me, this is the truth. There's the four C's. Are you ready? Thank you for asking. I'm going to tell them to you. Number one, you got to be convinced by God that He's real. Come on. Amen. And His Word is true. Amen, brother. you got to be convicted in your heart by the Holy Ghost. And then converted by the power of God. Yes. And the last C is letting Him control your life. Yes. Amen. Convince, convict, convert, and control. He doesn't want you to have a form of His godliness. He wants you to be surrendered in repentance. For Paul says it's a godly sorrow. Leading to repentance unto salvation. Yes. Not sorry you got caught. But sorry you did what you did to get caught. Oh, I've seen him come and seen him go. There's a man in prison that got out recently that I've known for 33 years here in Oregon. 33 calendar years I've known this man. And he got out of prison. And the pastor and his wife, who went to that prison in Ontario, where you've been, were volunteers like me. I'm on my 38th year. And they gave up their volunteer ability to go in the prisons because they wanted to help this one man. You can't help a man when he gets out of prison if you're a volunteer because it's, it's contrary to Oregon beliefs. Oh, I'm glad I'm in Texas where the gun told them Jesus freaks are if the Lord sent them a leader to help them out. <laughs> they gave up their ability to preach the gospel in prison to help one man. Because they saw his walk, walk with God for years. I've known him for 33. I've seen his walk. He gets out of prison. He's 62 years old. The pastor owns a cabbage and onion farm in Parma, Idaho. He's out there every day with a knife, cutting cabbage, bent over, throwing them in crates, putting them on an 18-wheeler, driving the truck to, to produce. He's working 4 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day. Pastor set him up in a fifth wheel. He now sits on a hill overlooking Snake River Prison where he spent all those years ah. as a free man cutting cabbage and loading onions. Yeah, yeah. And he honored me and Ron and Sherry last time we were there by cooking barbecue. And I met this pastor. Fell in love with this pastor. And he's asked me to come Sunday night, the 31st, <coughs> to tell the truth, to lay it out. To see that one woman for sure get set free. Amen. To see all the fractures in this room tonight that hurt. 
that are tired of being a pretender. Maybe it's not because you don't love Jesus. It's because you haven't experienced the power of God in your life yet to set the captive free. I've seen them come and I've seen them go. I've watched them. I've been in his church. I've seen the tears and the oil. Did you change the carpet? <laughs> What did you do with the oil stain? I told you, brother, you got to keep the oil stain. <laughs> Tina and I, my wife, and two sons lived in this house before it was converted into a church. I know this place. What you going to do, sir? Keep going to rehab? Keep being told, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. You'll never change. Oh, you can stay clean and sober. You know how you know when somebody's set free? They learn how to smile at you. <laughs> because their liver's not quivering. <laughs> Hello. I can't sit here and tell you honestly that it doesn't bother me to think about my mama and my daddy who would be in their 90s now if they were alive. I can't tell you that it doesn't bother me that I didn't get the privilege of this, this, and this because of my sin. But I can tell you this much. I don't live in my past anymore. No. For if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. That becoming new is a process. And when you get 68 and you're coloring your hair like I do because i got a young wife, you'll understand what the process is. Say amen. Amen. <laughs> Tina gets tired of me going into restaurants and the guy saying, where are you and your daughter like to sit? Excuse me, sir, to my wife. Thank you very much. <laughs> Don't charge me with a felony. I slipped. Your life counts. He left the 99 to go after you tonight, sir. He left the 99. To go after you, young lady. He left the 99 to let you know you're not a failure. Amen. And you're not a doormat for some man. Say amen. 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 I don't like getting calls from coroners like I did this morning. I don't like being reminded of my failures and my past mistakes and these things. But all it does is give me fuel for the fire. Mm. fuel to say listen God's word is real Christ really died mm. I'm tired of going in and out of treatment centers I'm tired of playing church I'm tired of this I'm tired of that see we got to get sick and tired of being sick and tired there's a classic cliche mm. we have to come to an end of ourselves yes. and say Lord Jesus I'm ready to be real to a real God mm. When my father was murdered and they transported the body from El Paso, Texas to Duncanville, south of Dallas to be buried next to Mama. I walked into that little Bethel funeral parlor, long hair down to here, bell bottoms, tie-dye shirt, needle marks all over my arms because I was from the 70s. Amen. Amen. I look better now. Glory to Jesus. <laughs> And there was a pulpit with a book opened up to sign your name. Three years before that, when Mama died, I was only 15 years old, and I remember walking in that same place trying to understand what happened as I watched my Mama, 120, 130 pound woman, go down to 70 pounds, her black hair had turned white and die of liver cancer. And there was that same book to sign your name. But when I came in there three years later for my daddy's funeral, I looked at that and I hated God. I didn't sign nothing. And I walked into that same viewing room. I took a left down the hallway. I walked in and there was the casket. There he was laying there with a bandage wrapped around his head. His face distorted from the swelling of the gunshot wound to his head. And there he was with his hands crossed across his chest and that diamond ring on his finger, and that whole memory of life going through my mind and asking myself, why? 
Couldn't I be a better son to a father who loved me? And then it dawned on me recently. I never thought about how my daddy felt to lose his wife of 21 years <coughs> to cancer. I never thought about how Pop felt raising three teenage children, my brother, four years older than me. He was 19, my sister was 17, I was 15 when Mama died. I never thought about his feelings. Then he started looking for love in all the wrong places three years after Mama died and finds himself murdered. I wonder how he felt. That day he came out to my trailer house with the woman that he was with who had him murdered for insurance money, found out later. I wondered, as he came and knocked on my door as I had methamphetamine hangover with my lips cracked open and bleeding, puking up blood, needle marks with infection coming out all over my arms and long nasty hair, I hadn't taken a shower in a couple days. And there's my pop. I'm wiping the blood off my lips and there he is at my door and he walks in and he hugs my neck and he says, son, I, I love you. I'm proud of you. You got your own place. Little did he know I was doing armed robberies to, to pay the rent. Oh, I'm so proud of you, son. He said, you know, I'm going to El Paso tomorrow to be married. I, I thought you might want to know. And he kissed me on my cheek and he whispered in my ear, I'm proud of you again. And everything in me wanted to say, I'm sorry, Pa. I, I really, I'm sorry for disappointing you. I, I'm sorry I'm an addict. I, I'm sorry, and I didn't do it. And when he drove away, I said to myself, I'll never forget it, standing in the doorway of my trailer. He'll be back in a few days. I'll see him again. The cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you coming home, Dad, I don't know when. But we'll get together then, son. You know we'll have a good time then. Then never came. It never came. I don't get a second chance like Jonah, who got a second chance to go to Nineveh. I didn't get it. Well, but I got something else. On that Mother's Day morning, May the 8th, 1977, pacing my house. My third tier jail cell at Ferguson unit. By the way, I've been preaching there since 2004. I'm on my 20th year anniversary going back to the very prison I was in to tell them the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Say amen. amen. And I'm pacing. I'm an animal in a cage, and I deserve to be there. And as I'm going back and forth, all of a sudden I'm hearing this, this voice in my heart. Now, I've seen a lot of things on LSD, and this wasn't that. And he said, Joseph, I love you just the way you are. And for the first time since Mama died, tears began to come down my face. The guilt, the remorse, the conviction of God. He was dealing with me and I didn't even know who it was yet. And I wanted to jump off the third tier to my death, bro. I wanted to get rid of me. I hated me so much that I was waiting for the opportunity for the, man, the boss to flick those switches electronically and crank that crank and let my cell door open. I was going to jump my 35 feet to my death. But as I planned that out, all of a sudden now I'm feeling this thing, this voice. Glory to the Lamb. Jesus is on the main line. Tell him what you want. Come on. And... I stood there as the door opened. And as God is my witness, it was like God put handcuffs on me. He arrested me. And he took me down to the prodigal son chapel. And it was there as I closed this message. 400 men in white, just like me. Joe Wilkins alone in the midst of the crowd. A young inmate came up to me after the Mother's Day message that morning, 1977. As all those inmates got to go visit their mamas that were there to visit them. And I wanted Mama to be there to visit me. Oh, how I wanted Mama. 
But then part of me was like, man, I wouldn't want my own mother to see me in prison. The battle was on. Do you all understand what I'm talking about? The battle. The war. And that young inmate came up to me and sat down, read my name, Wilkins, and he said, you know what, man? I got an answer for you. And I remember wiping tears from my eyes, trying to be the tough guy, because you don't weep in prison. He began to tell me about Jesus. <coughs> And how he loved me. And then he told me the story. How he was in prison there at Ferguson. For life without the possibility of parole. Because he killed his landlord with a hammer. For the first time in his life he drank alcohol and blacked out and killed his landlord. He doesn't even remember doing it. But yet they gave him life without parole. And the man looked at me. He was 19 years old. His name was Steve. Blonde hair, blue eyes. And he looked at me. And I've never seen it again. I haven't seen it again since all those years. A man looking at me and I could see so much love coming out of his eyes <coughs> toward me. I know what it was now. It was the Holy Ghost staring back at me, but I didn't know it then. And he began to tell me about repentance. Tell me about you don't have to be alone anymore, Joe, when you're suffering. And he led me to Jesus Christ that day. That was 47 years ago. And Jesus Christ is sweeter today than he was that day. Amen. Because he grows sweeter Amen. and sweeter Amen. and sweeter. Amen. Bow your heads with me tonight, church. If you're here tonight, man. If you're here tonight, sir. If you're here tonight, young person. If you're here tonight, maybe you're living in a home right now with your issues. But you are not alone in the midst of this crowd tonight. You that are watching by YouTube in the future, whatever the case is, live stream, you are not alone in your living room. You are not alone in that hospital. You are not alone in that rehab because Christ crucified, rose again, sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us who believe in Him. Amen. You are not alone. Amen. That's right. And you're certainly not a loner. With your heads bowed just for a moment, please. Nobody looking around. You say, you know what, preacher, I, I, I hear you. More importantly, I sensed something in me that I've never sensed before. I know I've sinned. I know it's wrong. I know that God loves me. And i got to deal with me tonight. If that's you, we're going to pray in just a moment. First altar call, you've never received Christ. You've never surrendered your life. Slip up your hand. Put it right back down. Even if you're at home, slip up your hand. It's okay. Amen. Amen. Put your hand down. You're here and you say, you know what, I love Jesus, but I've done some things and I need to get it right with God privately at this altar tonight. Lift up your hand. Come on, church, be honest. Amen, amen. Put your hands down. We're going to pray a prayer here in a moment. The third altar call is this. You love Jesus, you believe in God, you, you, you surrendered your life to Christ, but you still feel alone in the midst of a crowd. Put your hand up right where you're at, even at home. Amen, amen. It's okay, put your hands down. Barry, help me here for a moment, sir. Move all this stuff. I want you to think about your decision that you just made with an uplifted hand. I want you to think about your commitment. Because this is about you. Even if you're watching this and you're sitting there at home, it's about you, sir. It's about you, ma'am. It's about you, young person. It's about you, addict. It's about you, ex-felon. It's about your life and your eternity. God doesn't play games when it comes to eternity. Yeah. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and lets me enter in, I will sup with him and he will dine with me. It's called a relationship. Yeah. He's knocking. You're a hurting Christian. You want to surrender your life to Christ, whatever that case might be. I want you to make your way to this altar right now in Jesus' name. Church, give them a hand clap as they come. Amen. Oh, come on, give me my hand clap. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If you can physically bend the knee, physically bend the knee with me tonight. I'm not going to do it because I'll need a forklift to get me out of the Just lift up your hand. Because you're hurting, you need to come to this altar. 
Come on, ladies. You know who you are. You saw, I, I seen you raise your hand. Don't wake me. Come get you. I'm too tired. Come on up. Let's pray. Come on, ladies. Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't be a rebel. So was that hand painted on, or am I having an LSD flashback? Right now? God loves you. Come on. You know, there's something about coming to an old-fashioned altar where you say, I surrender. I don't care what people think. But we're going to pray a prayer. We're going to pray it at home, too. The Bible says that when you and I confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart, your heart, one believes unto righteousness. Out of the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It's a simple prayer. But you've got to meet it with your heart. Yes, and that's what God wants from you, is to meet it with your heart. So when everybody in here that is at this altar and seated or at home, pray this out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord I'm, Jesus. I'm sorry for I'm sorry. the things I've done. I know I've sinned. We've all sinned. But well, I know this. I'm in need of a Savior. I need to be rescued. I need to be given a second chance. I believe your word. And your word says, if I confess my sin, and I'm doing that now, you forgive. And you cleanse me of all unrighteousness because of your precious blood. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. And I receive my salvation. I repent. I turn from my wickedness. God, I'm asking you to give me the power, to give me the strength to be a man of God, to be a woman of God. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Don't get up yet, man. This is not my first rodeo. You're a cowboy. I know hurting people. Some of you have got chaos around you. Some of you have loneliness, even with Jesus, and you don't know how to deal with that. Some of us, when we're young, we're stupid. Say amen to that. Amen. <laughs> But you're still loved by God. Amen. I don't want to close this altar until I have a chance to pray for you. So I want you to come. Last chance to come tonight for prayer. If you've got family members that are sick. If you've got children that are wayward. If you have anything going on in your life. Maybe there's a family member that you want to intercede with. We're going to agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you have a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, an aunt, an uncle. Maybe you have an ex-wife, an ex-husband, whatever it might be. Listen, we battle not with flesh and blood. This is not about you. It's about them sometimes, right? We've all sinned. And they deserve to make heaven their home too. Come, come young lady, I want to pray for you. Whitney, stand with her. Get some oil, brother. Let's just begin with her. Okay. Come here, young lady. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for this name of God. Lift your hands, sister. I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. No longer does she have to feel abandoned, rejected, misunderstood, or confused about her walk with you. Because she's married to you, Jesus. She's not a failure. She's not a person who is without gifts that are given to her without repentance. She is a woman of God with character and integrity and it's growing stronger every day. But Lord, there's still that longing for fact. There's still that sense of urgency in a way because of time. Time is on your side, sister. Look up for your redemption draw a knife. God has a plan for you that is perfect. 